One year ago, when the crisis in Ukraine became the dominant story in the international media, at least for a few weeks, many people were taken by surprise. But was there anything really surprising in what was unfolding in this volatile part of the world? One can look at this problem from four aspects that have unfolded uh, during the past year. Russia's annexation of Crimea, the strategic goals of Putin's Russia for the rest of Ukraine, and most recently, the unexpected appearance of Hungary and its interest in Ukraine's territory of Transcarpathia. And lastly, the response of Ukraine's leaders to the so-called Rusin question. As I said before in a longer presentation that dealt primarily with Crimea and Russia's strategic goals, we have seen that already from the very outset of the 21st century, not just the last couple of years, namely well over a decade, Volodymyr Putin has been, so to speak, poking at what he considers Ukraine's weak spots, the Donetsk Donbass region. Crimea, and Transcarpathia. Now, we are all aware of what has transpired in Crimea and in the Donetsk, Donbass region, but what about Transcarpathia? In early November 2014, Paul Goebel, a commentator for the Jamestown Foundation, which is that influential think tank in the United States, wrote a blog entitled, and I quote, Moscow using Budapest to put Rusins in play against Kiev. In other words, Russia's off and on interest since the outset of the 21st century in the so-called Rusin question in Transcarpathia has taken a new turn. Cooperation with the present right-wing oriented government of Hungary under that country's Prime Minister Viktor Orban. In essence, both Putin and Orban are products of their respective country's historical past and each sees himself as the instrument to fulfill his country's destiny. Now, in the case of Putin, it is Eurasian Russia, which would obviously include, from the Russian perspective, Little Russia or Ukraine. In the case of Orban, it is historic Hungary. That is, Hungary before its dismemberment by the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. Pre-Trianon, Hungary included territory in every country that borders present-day Hungary, uh, namely uh, southern Slovakia, Transylvania, Vojvodina in Serbia, the Burgenland in Austria, Transcarpathia in Ukraine. And like Putin, Orban considers that it is Hungary's right, it is Hungary's duty, to protect ethnic Hungarians living in those countries. In other words, in Hungary's new abroad, or near abroad, this includes the 150,000 or so Hungarian minority concentrated in southern Transcarpathia. And as part of this truly unexpected Hungarian-Russian 
mutual geopolitical interest, both Putin and Orban's policy advisors have been playing the Carpetho-Rusin Carpetho card, if you will, or exploiting Ukraine's Rusin question. Now, this is not the time or the place to launch into a historical discourse on Carpetho-Rusins and the history of Transcarpathia. But since most listeners, both within and beyond Ukraine, have at best only a vague sense of that country's farthest western oblast, a few observations need to be made. Transcarpathia, or historic Subcarpathian Rus, was the last territorial acquisition of the Soviet Union and therefore of Ukraine. Requ uh, having been acquired actually only at the close of World War II in 1945. That territory, Transcarpathia, was never part of Kiev and Rus, the historic predecessor of the East Slavic lands. Rather, for 800 years, that is, from the early 12th century until World War I, Transcarpathia was an integral part of the Hungarian kingdom. Then in the 20th century, during the interwar years, it was part of the new state of Czechoslovakia, then forcibly returned to Hungary during World War II, until liberated by Soviet troops in the fall of 1944. Now, Transcarpathia may have been ruled by different countries, the Hungarian Kingdom, Habsburg, Austria-Hungary, Czechoslovakia, but it often had a distinct political status. As early as 1848, the region's civic leaders called for and actually received from the Habsburg rulers at the time a degree of self-rule. And then the territory actually achieved some form of autonomy as the Rus land in late 1918 Hungary, and then as Subcarpathian Rus, also briefly called Carpatho Ukraine, in Czechoslovakia between 1919 and 1939. Most recently, in December 1991, no less than 78% of the inhabitants voted yes in a referendum that called for autonomy, literally self-government of Samoguriadovania, that is for Transcarpathian, or for Transcarpathia uh, in Ukraine. The results of that referendum were never fulfilled, however, by the central government uh, in Kiev. So much for politics. What about the inhabitants of Transcarpathia? The majority of those inhabitants have always been comprised of East Slavs, although their national identity has remained problematic until today. The people have traditionally called themselves Rusnaks or Rusins and have at various times described themselves as belonging either to the Russian nationality, or to the Ukrainian nationality, or to a distinct Carpetho-Rusin nationality. In 1945, the new Soviet regime proclaimed that it resolved the nationality question by simply declaring that all the indigenous East Slavic inhabitants of the Carpathian region were Ukrainian. Following the collapse of communist rule and of the Soviet Union, it turned out that Carpetho Rusin still existed, not only in Ukraine's Transcarpathian region,
but also in immediately neighboring Slovakia, in Poland, in Hungary, and Romania. Since 1989, each of those now member countries of the European Union has recognized Rusins, Carpatho Rusins, as a distinct nationality. By contrast, independent Ukraine has been reluctant to act on the nationality question or the national identity question. Most central government and intellectual circles in Ukraine hold to the 19th century view of Ukrainian national ideologists, and for that matter, Soviet Marxist ideologists as well, that there never was nor will there ever be a distinct carpatho russian nationality. And anyone who holds such views is either unenlightened or a separatist opposed to Ukraine. As a result of pressure from the United States government, from the European Union, and from carpatho russian diaspora and organizations, some movement on this issue occurred during the first decade of the 21st century. In March 2007, the elected Transcarpathian Regional Assembly, the Oblastna Rada, passed by an overwhelming majority, 72 votes to two, a decree recognizing Rusins as a distinct nationality. And then in, in 2012, Ukraine's language law, which still is in force, listed Rusin as one of Ukraine's official languages. Such then are the two components of Ukraine's Rusin question. The unresolved 1991 referendum on autonomy, and the unresolved issue of recognition of Carpatho Rusins as a distinct nationality at the national level. Both these issues, both these issues are now being exploited not only by Putin's Russia, but also by Orban's Hungary. What then should be done? And by whom? By Russia, or Hungary, Carpatho Rusins and Ukraine. As for Russia, one cannot expect any change. Putin's propaganda machine will continue to promote whatever elements within or beyond that are inclined to view Russia as the region's savior and alleged guarantor of the Carpatha Russa nationality and Transcarpathian autonomy. As for Hungary, support should be given to those forces within the country which oppose Prime Minister Orban and the far-right Jobbik party with its misplaced dreams of reuniting pre-Trianon, pre-World War I Hungary. Pre-Trianon restoration of any kind would require changing borders and therefore bring an end to the political order and stability of the European Union. And one must wonder how Hungary's present day right-wing parties or patriots can be so naive to expect help and cooperation from Russia. Now while on the one hand those patriots remember and long for pre-Trianon historic Hungary. They conveniently forget how Hungary's 1849 War of Independence was defeated by Tsarist Russian troops and how the valiant revolution of 1956 was crushed by Soviet tanks dispatched from Moscow. And as for the Hungarian minority in Transcarpathia, no amount of propaganda from Hungary can change the fact that their status under independent Ukraine's rule has been as good, if not better, than that of any other Hungarian minority living in countries adjacent to Hungary. 
Now, as for Carpathia Rusans, the vast majority within Transcarpathia, as well as in neighboring countries and in the diaspora in America, simply wish that they be recognized as a distinct nationality and that their language and culture be promoted in the countries where they live. They have basically achieved those goals after the revolution of 1999, in, in 1989, in all countries but one, and that is in Ukraine. The worldwide Carpathorusian movement has never been interested in creating a separate state. It is opposed to changing international borders, and it has always supported the territorial integrity of Ukraine, and most importantly, its eventual inclusion in the European Union. And with regard to those elements among Carpathorusians who indeed look to Russia, let them remember what the East brought them, or rather did not bring them. Russian intellectual circles have never accepted the view that Carpathorusians are a distinct nationality. And when in the guise of the Soviet Union, so-called real Russians finally took control of the region in 1945, within a few years they brutally undermined traditional Carpathorusian cultural values by destroying the Greek Catholic Church, taking away their precious land, and banning their language and national identity. Carpathorusians have never gotten, nor do they need, help from Russia, whether Tsarist, Soviet, or Putinesque. And finally, Ukraine. Ukraine has created the Rusin question, and Ukraine can resolve the Rusin question. It simply makes no sense to deny the reality of a people within or beyond Ukraine which exists and claims it belongs to a distinct nationality. It makes no sense to deny the validity of the December 1991 referendum on autonomy. Deal with autonomy in the context of the decentralization of government power throughout Ukraine. Most importantly, recognize Carpathian Rusins as a distinct nationality. This is a basic human right that was resolved by neighboring countries in the European Union years ago. Sooner or later, Ukraine will have to get in step with the European Union and act positively on the Carpathian Rusin nationality recognition. Doing the right thing, and doing it now, will show that the leadership in Kiev is firmly committed to making their country a European Ukraine and not a Eurasian Little Russia. Thank you.